43, sorry, Proverbs 10, on page 643, and I will be reading 1 to 5. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. He who gathers crops in a summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Um, lovely to see everybody here. I think we've probably chosen one of the cooler places to be this morning, although possibly, oops, possibly not for long. Right, well, we're carrying on in the book of Proverbs. And if you haven't got it handy, um, it is handy. There are Bibles um, under the chairs or on the pews, as last week. Might be kind of helpful to follow along with some of those. But if that doesn't work for you, don't worry. I will read them all out as we go. Um, my name is Andrew. I'm uh, the, the curate here, kind of like a trainee vicar. Um, let me pray, and then let's look at Proverbs together. Father God, thank you that you are wise, though we are not wise. We know ourselves not to be wise. So often the choices we make, the things we do, the questions we have, the frustrations that we have, the challenges that life presents us with that we don't know how to deal with. But you are wise, and you are there with us, guiding us. And so, Lord, as we look now at your inspired word, would you speak to us by your Holy Spirit? Open our eyes, make us wise, lead us more into the likeness of Christ. And we ask that in his name. Amen. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was out um, in the USA um, for a friend's wedding, obviously quite a while ago, not in the last couple of years, um, and uh, we went to this all-you-can-eat buffet place. Now, I imagine many of us have been to an all-you-can-eat buffet place. It's often, in the UK, they're often um, an Oriental or a Chinese buffet. And let's be honest, buffet restaurant often means not quite as good as what you would get if you ordered meals individually and paid for them. You know, you go up and it's a little bit kind of digging it out of troughs and kind of scooping it and putting it on your plate. And I don't know about you, always slightly disappointing. This place, Shady Maple Farms, all you can eat, somewhere in Connecticut, another level. You went in and literally, as far as the eye could see, there was food. It was, honestly, the place was about the size of a football field. And as I say, it wasn't less quality. It was the best quality. You know, steak, prawn, salmon, sushi, fresh salads, whatever you wanted. Lots of it just kind of cooked to order. You went up, you ordered it, they cooked it. It was amazing. And all for the princely sum of about $30 or something like that. All the kinds of desserts you can imagine. It was amazing. Proverbs is wisdom's buffet. Proverbs is wisdom's buffet. Cast your mind back to last week, or if you want to follow along, page uh, 642, chapter 9. We read this last week. If you're on chapter 10, it's just to the left. We read this last week. Wisdom is personified as lady wisdom, and she calls to us, and we hear this. Uh, verse 1, chapter 9, wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. A, it's a big house. B, as you may know, seven is the biblical number of perfection. It's a perfect house. And in her house, she has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point of the city. 
Let all who are simple, all who have not yet learned, all who are not yet wise, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have sense, no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. So it's not just food to keep us alive. It's food to make us wise. Food to teach us how to live life well. Food to stop us being simple. And that's the close. Chapter 9 is sort of the close of the introductory section of Proverbs. And so as we go into the main body of the book of Proverbs, what you might normally think of as the the kind of the Proverbs, do this and that happens, do this and that happens, verses 10 through uh, 29, in chapters 1 to 10, the, the dominant voice has been that of parents speaking to a child. So in chapters 1 to 9, it's as if we are children in our parents' house. And at the end of chapter 9, wisdom calls us and says, now's time to grow up. Come out of your parents' house, live life for yourself, work out what life will look like. Now is the time to become wise, to make your own decisions. And we trek on through chapters 10 through to chapter 29, and it begins with simple wisdom. So keeping with the buffet metaphor, keeping with the food metaphor, chapters 10 to 15 is, is your simple starters, your classics, the things that you know how to deal with. So cheese and bacon potato skins, or tomato soup, or um, prawn cocktail if it was the 1980s. And we're invited to, as I say, step out and step into a more sophisticated way of thinking in chapters um, 16 through 29. But as I say, chapter 10, what we had read today, keeping things simple. So I don't know what you thought as Jennifer read of some of these. Uh, Verse 2, ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. And you might have thought, well, actually, I know someone who made all of their money by shady property deals or drugs or criminal activity of some other kind. And they're living off the fat of the land. I personally know someone who's living in a lovely big house um, in Kent who made all of their money by ill-gotten gains. And as far as we can see, they're living to a ripe old age, happily retiring. Whereas we know of good people who've died young. So what does it mean that ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value when that guy I know is seemingly great lasting value from the money he made, but others we know have died young and to us were far more righteous, it seems. What about the next one? Verse 3, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Well, again, you know, think of Ethiopia right now. Are we saying that all those who are hungry are unrighteous? Whereas those who are making money off those who are, the, you know, the militias who are taking the aid that is intended for those who need it the most and keeping it for themselves, well, they seem to be the wicked and their craving for more seems not to be being thwarted. So is verse 3 true? What about verse 4? Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Again, I'm sure all of us know people who don't work particularly hard, but they've done very well in life. And others who have worked hard all through their life are still working hard now, two or three jobs to feed their family, to pay the rent, and they're never going to be wealthy, barring a win on the lottery. So what's the deal here? Well, as we said last week, Proverbs gives us what is mostly true most of the time. So mostly, those who work hard will have more financially than those who don't. Most of the time, we know that that's true. And as I say, 10 uh, 10 through 15 in the book of Proverbs sets out these simple truths, these simple observations on life. But Proverbs itself knows that life is subtler than that. So it's like with a child, you teach them right from wrong, you say, do do this, don't do that. Say yes, say please, say thank you, all these sorts of things. But as we grow older, we know that sometimes it's not that simple. Things aren't always right or wrong, yes or no, black and white. A friend of mine said if he ever wrote a book, a book about what it means to live as a Christian, he'd call it living in the gray. 
because things aren't always black or white. Most of our lives, much of our lives, is lived in wisdom. Not is this right or is this wrong, but which is better? Which is the wiser choice in this situation? So let me give you an example of how Proverbs itself acknowledges this. Verse 15 of chapter 10 says, The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. So basically, if you're wealthy, it's like you are a fortified city with a big wall around you. You'll be absolutely safe. Nothing can happen to you. But those who are poor, well, they are defenseless. Remember that. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. And flip over to uh, chapter 18, page 653, chapter 18. And verse 11 And the first half of the verse is exactly the same. Now, this happens a number of times through Proverbs. One-fifth of the book of Proverbs is repeated from somewhere else in the book, these oft-told Proverbs. Sometimes the whole proverb is identical, and sometimes like this, chapter 18, verse 11, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. Again, same deal. The wealth of the rich is like a fortification around them. They'll be safe. But the second half of the verse... They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Or as another translation puts it, the wealth of the rich is like a high wall around them, but only in their imagination. As we know, wealth can come and go. Worldly wealth is ultimately no defense, no security. So as I say, Proverbs 10 through 15 teaches us the basics of wisdom. If you do good, if you work hard, life will go well. If you work hard, wealth will come to you. And therefore, the assumption that, well, if you're wealthy, then you must be righteous. Because if it's the righteous who get wealthy, if it's those who work hard who become wealthy, then the wealthy, by definition, must be righteous in order to get there. But again, we know that's not true. So Proverbs actually teaches us verse 10 of chapter 18, if you're still on that page, where is true security? Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. True security is only in God. And what about the wealth, those who have the high walls in their imagination? Well, from verse 11 to verse 12, before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Now, what proverb does that translate into in English that we often use? The man at the back. Pride comes before a fall. That's right. That's where we get this from. Pride comes before a fall. Those who think they are secure, well, often it is a truism, isn't it? Pride comes before a fall leads us to not being careful. So as I say, 10 to 15 simple starters, 16 to 29, I'm thinking of as like fancy main courses. And when you get to fancy main courses, you need to know what goes with what, otherwise you make something disgusting. Get it right, you know, those things like sort of cocoa-infused beef stew, that sort of thing where you think, what, chocolate and beef, that's a terrible idea, and then you try it and it's amazing. But if you get it wrong, it's horrible. Um, when we go to eat these more subtle dishes, we need to know what to eat when. What goes with what? And most importantly, it is as we eat, as we chew, as we digest, and as we use our bodies that we become strong. If we just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, and that's all we ever do, that's not a recipe for health and strength. But if we use that energy, and if we use this wisdom, then we become wise. So let's remind ourselves what a proverb is. I said last week, I, I, I began last week with a, um, a bit of a, what sounded like a rant against technology, but I'm reassuring you that it's not as I look up some notes here. Um, a proverb is a recommended way of acting that is normally true, that works in some circumstances, but not necessarily in others. That is, it is a general observation of experience 
that is often very true and useful, but not in every situation. Now, one of the clearest places that we see this is in Proverbs chapter 25, um, verses 4 and 5. Sorry, Proverbs 26, but it's on the same page, so you'll find it easily. Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. And here we read this. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly. Now the rip will get worse, and you'll need to do a much bigger repair later. Um, Think of, you say, you've got a, a burst water pipe in your house, and it's leaking into your house. If you don't fix that now, then you're not only gonna have to fix the water pipe, you're gonna have to fix the ceiling because it's flooded through and, and, and ruined that as well. So you're not only gonna have to get a plumber, you're also gonna have to get a builder. But if your plumber or if you rush in, smash the whole thing, do it too quickly, don't do it carefully enough, then actually it's gonna be much worse than it was in the first place, more haste, less speed. So again, we need to know what is the right application for each situation. Well, back then to Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. When should we answer a fool according to his folly? And when should we not answer a fool according to his folly? Well, verse 4 to start with, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. This is for those situations where you know that if you jump in at this point, it's just going to spiral. You're going to say something they're going to say something back. You're going to say something, they're going to say something back. It's going to elevate and elevate and elevate and elevate, spiral out of control. No one's going to convince anybody else. It's just going to get much worse. Basically, most conversations on Twitter and Facebook. But sometimes a word of challenge is helpful and necessary. Someone is saying something really stupid, something stupid, something unhelpful. Other people are listening to them and being convinced by them. And in that situation, that then is a verse five situation where you have the knowledge, the ability to step in and say, you are wrong because X, Y, Z. And we're not to do this in a grandstanding way. Oh, look at me, I'm right, I'm the wise one, I'm so much better than you. But it is to help them themselves. This is where it matters that Proverbs is relational that we do it in the fear of the Lord, that we do it ultimately out of love, out of love for the person who is speaking foolishly themselves, out of love for the others who are being deceived by their foolish words. So again, not grandstanding, not cruel, not a kind of a smackdown, kindly, gently, lovingly, for their good and for the good of others. Well, what difference then does Proverbs make and the subtlety of Proverbs, as I say? Turn with me to chapter 16 and just a little meditation on something that's been helpful to me this week. This is Proverbs 16. Now, Proverbs is interesting. One way of preaching Proverbs, I mean, it's it's a tricky book to try and work out how to preach because of the, the sometimes seeming randomness through the book. But there are also themes. There are themes that run through the book, friendship, work, family, But also there are clusters, clusters of Proverbs at different times that teach certain things. And Proverbs 1 to 9 is one of those little clusters. So let me read these and see if you can see the theme that runs through 16, 1 to 9. To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, He causes their enemies to make peace with them. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. In their hearts, humans plan their course, 
but the Lord establishes their steps. Do you see the theme? We live out our lives on this side of the eternal curtain, you might say. God is the other side. We do not know how our lives are going to work out. We do not know what tomorrow is going to be. We do not know what the future is going to be. We do not know how things are going to work out. But God does. And ultimately, though we make plans, and it is right that we make plans, verse 60, chapter 16, verse 1, to humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. When we speak rightly, it is because it was God helping us to speak rightly. Sure, it's right that we make plans. It's good to make plans, but ultimately what will happen in life is down to the Lord. Verse 9, as clear as it could be, in their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Again, we make plans in our hearts, but actually where we'll end up, what life will go like, is established by the Lord. As some of you know, um, my wife and I had a very, very difficult um, decision to make this last couple of weeks. Um, my curacy, my time here, comes to an end at the end of this month, at the end of June, and we had two options. Two churches said to us, we'd love you to come and work with us. And they couldn't have been more different. Uh, one church was in Stratford, in East London, inner city, East London. The other was in Barnston, um, on the Wirral. Um, green, the church was surrounded effectively by fields, um, the vicarage was a huge Victorian mansion of a place in Stratford, um, we'd be renting somewhere London-sized. Um, the uh, church in Stratford is mostly people in their 20s and 30s, in Barnston it's mostly people who are older than being in their 20s and 30s. Uh, Barnston is 97.7% white British. Stratford is the most ethnically diverse place in Europe at the moment, apparently. In Stratford, people are highly mobile. They come and go. They move in. They move out. Lots of young professionals, lots of students. And in Barnston, people live there, and they live there for a very long time. And the churches were quite different in terms of what we would be doing there. In, Str in Barnston, I would have been the vicar overseeing a team in Stratford, I would be a part of the team, being the assistant minister to the vicar in that church. Almost everything that could be different about these two churches was different. My wife's family is on the Wirral. Um, my family are down in Folkestone. And we wrestled, and we wrestled, and we wrestled, and we wrestled, and we drew lists of pros and cons, pages and pages of pros and cons for each place. And we decided that we would go to one, and then we thought, we're really not sure about that decision. So we decided that we would go to the other. And then we thought, we're really not sure about that decision either. And as I said to Grace, is it deeply appropriate or deeply ironic that I'm needing to be preaching on Proverbs at this time? The Lord doesn't just give us an answer. And there's a, a helpful book, Kevin DeYoung, it's called Just Do Something. And he says, God is not a magic eight ball God. I've only ever seen them on American TV shows, but kind of like it's like a bowling ball that you shake and it comes up with yes or no or maybe or the outlook is not good or various other things. That's not how God works. God gives us what we need to be trained in wisdom to help ourselves to make a good decision. Now, we've decided to go to Stratford and that's where we are going. But as soon as we made that decision, we found a real wrench to go, but should we have decided to go to Barnston? And emotionally, we're not there yet. We're still not excited. We're still, we're still struggling. It's hard to be excited about something when you also see very vividly how much you've lost from the other place because there were such good things, different things that were good about both places. And so Proverbs 16 verse 9 has been a real encouragement to me this week is a real encouragement to me. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Now, that wouldn't work if there'd been a choice, you know, between, okay, we've got two career options, either become a criminal mastermind or, you know, go and do an honest job or carry on a ministry. 
That would not have been a wise decision to take the criminal mastermind route in the light of what Proverbs says about the righteous and the wicked. But with two good options, we couldn't really make a bad choice. And now that we have made a choice, we can now look back and say, this must be right because we made it with prayer, we made it with care, we made it with much counsel, with much advice. Uh, Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And we decided it and we've committed it to the Lord. And now knowing that, we can know this now is the right path. This now is the right approach. But as I say, it doesn't make it easier. And it's been, without a doubt, the most difficult um, time of our marriage so far, deciding that. Not because we've not been united, almost because we have been united, because neither has wanted to go against the other person's wishes, which has been really tricky at times. Well, as we close, just flip back to Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Proverbs 2, verses 1 to 6. Because as I've said, Proverbs itself doesn't make us wise. We need to be wise to know how to apply the Proverbs. And verses 1 to 6 teach us how to do that. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Where does wisdom come from? Well, verse 1, it comes from storing up God's commands within us. First accepting his words, verse 1, and then storing up his commands, reading the Bible, knowing the Bible, as far as possible, memorizing scripture, reading it so often that we know it so that it comes to mind, so that it comes to our hearts, perhaps deliberately memorizing particular verses or chapters or short books. Store up God's commands within us, treasure it. Secondly, meditate on it. Verse two, applying your heart to understanding, think about it. So with that answer a fool, answer not a fool, is this a situation where I should speak? Or is this a situation where I shouldn't speak? And wisdom will come as we think, as we meditate, as we meditate in the context of knowing God's words. Verse three, thirdly, call out for insight. Cry aloud for understanding. That is, pray. Ask God, ask God for wisdom. Call out for insight, cry aloud for understanding and seek it earnestly, verse 4, if you look for it as silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. Kevin DeYoung, in that little book I mentioned, Just Do Something, has this great question where he says, if someone came to you and said, I will give you 10 million pounds cash, a huge mansion, the holiday of your choice every year for the rest of your life, paying your kids through university, through college, and the, the retirement that you dream of, or I could give you wisdom, what would you choose? And he says the wise person would choose wisdom. And I'll tell you what I, what I thought when I read that. I thought I'd say, give me all that money now, and then I've got loads of time and freedom to become wise, which shows that my instant heart response was not wise, and I need to be wiser. This says, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, Wisdom is more precious, more precious than gold, more precious than money. Again, think of the lottery winners. Think of how many of the lottery winners have gone on happy and joyful in their lives and how many have ended up bankrupt and broken. Because ultimately, verse 6, it is the Lord who gives wisdom. So pray, seek, but ultimately it's the Lord who who gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And all of it, verse 5, in the context of this relationship with God, the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. True wisdom is knowing that our lives are in God's hands, knowing that God directs our paths, and knowing that wisdom is not 
sorry, we, success is not primarily about success in this life. So what we saw there in chapter 10, ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value. Well, they do have no lasting value into eternity, once you take eternity into account. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Yes, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand years from now, well, it will be the righteous, those who have put their trust in Christ, those who have followed God's paths, who will be well-fed for eternity. So as we read the Proverbs, we should read them in that sense, and actually then they do always apply. And so, I don't know whether anyone did, um, I exhorted last week, I said, try maybe reading one chapter of the Proverbs each day. Um, the Proverbs, there's 31 chapters. If you read a chapter a day, kind of each month, that is a great way to make us wise, to store up God's commands within us. So let's pray now that as we read God's word, as we meditate on it, as we seek to apply it to our lives, as we seek to live this life wisely, that God would make us wise and ultimately make us wise for salvation. Let's pray that. Father God, we do thank you. Thank you indeed for your word. And as we've been looking at this somewhat confusing, um, somewhat challenging book that we don't quite know how to deal with that's different from what we used to in, in the Gospels or in the letters, Father, please would you make us wise. Would you help us to read it for ourselves, read it in light of the cross, read it in light of the resurrection, read it in light of the life of the perfect wise one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And would you make us wise, wise in this life, but wise ultimately into eternity, for live, to live for you now and to live with you forever. And we ask that in Jesus' name.